do another live stream, uh, live code hangout. We're going to be working on the Western Friend website today. We've got a task at hand. We're moving from Braintree payments to PayPal, which uh, Braintree is a subsidiary of PayPal, but they have a distinct checkout experience. Um, we have a couple of mockups here. This is what we're aiming for. Today I'll be working on this subscribe portion. And what I'll be creating is a generic interface that allows um, the editor, the content manager, to define subscriptions on PayPal. They can set the price and all their other details. And they'll just need to copy and paste a subscription key and save it in our Wagtail website. And it'll render these subscription options, as many or few as they want. I recommended that we try to aim for around three at the most, but I think that's not going to be what we see in practice. Uh, anyway, it's their decision. So I've got a pull request open. If you just want to see the work that's involved, you can jump straight to the pull request to see the exact lines I've changed. And I'll point out I'm working mainly in two applications in our source code here, the payment and PayPal apps. So at the end of the day, if you just want to see the PayPal part, you can just hop over to this PayPal app and see how I've defined it. Most of these will be empty, but we do have a couple of views and some templates. The integration on our side is very minimal. I'll have to decide on a backend view that will um, essentially take a, a PayPal subscription ID that will be passed in from our client code here, this subscription ID, and validate that on the backend that it is a successful payment or whatever the necessity uh, what are the necessary data attributes are um, link that with a user in our system now the user has to be logged in in order to call that endpoint as well as in order to render this view here so we do have a bit of uh, at least authentication in place authorization in place and though I don't really like the PayPal flow overall is what we've settled on and it does save some time I, I don't have to write a lot of code it just leaves a bit of the edge case validation to the developer uh, but i've gone kind of at length about why i believe uh, people should try avoiding paypal for their subscription provider in previous episodes <laughs> and of course it's an opinion and could be i could be missing something but the amount of work and the awkwardness of the developer experience it feels like an uncanny valley like PayPal's kind of gone their own direction with how they uh, believe subscriptions should work and every other industry competitor like Stripe or even Braintree have a different perspective and I appreciate the uh, Braintree perspective after having worked with that firsthand I don't know about Stripe so nonetheless I would suggest probably to look at Stripe first for your subscription payments it seems to be very well documented and well maintained. Cool. Let's get into the code. So this um, is how you render these buttons. It's a, and I need to import, I forgot this script tag. We'll have to import the PayPal JavaScript at least in the parent template and then run, render a button. PayPal buttons that will get the plan ID from the template context and render the appropriate information into the thing. So all the rendering is happening in the JavaScript. I'll need a view to call on the success and it can be PayPal subscription link. That's cool. So let's create a URL here.
So I have a bit of issues with my uh, wiring here. Let's see if this gets picked up. My Pi is a bit slow. So let's create this new um, view. So I think what I'll do is on approve, we'll call this endpoint. It'll do its thing. It'll return success or error. On success, we will redirect somewhere. This should make a post request because it's having a side effect on the server. And in the payload, we should post the uh, subscription ID. So let's see if kind of uh, what we get here. So we return this. We don't need to necessarily return it. Yeah, that's essentially it. We'll, re we'll redirect. So now we'll need a PayPal subscription link. So link PayPal subscription view. So I'll get my parts in place. This is gonna have a little bit of dependency between these models. I don't know if this is the right order to do that or if the, it's the Western, should the service, the PayPal service be dependent on Western friends subscription or for the Western friends subscription be dependent on the PayPal service? It sounds like the other way around. I don't know. I don't have a strong opinion. Yep. Import subscription. So I'll just give myself the code. Request, check this post request. All right, let's just see. There might be a decorator for this. So that's not necessary anymore. Hmm. Well, it was a good guess. Huh. 
Oh uh, yeah, just ruin just do this. You know, honestly, if I just do this. Question mark is I'm switching keyboards. All right. Let's see what it says. Get the subscription. So we'll have to actually create the subscription. This doesn't exist yet. That's coming in here. I don't know if it's more conventional to use that. I guess it's using it. I'm going to stick with it. Again, this is though. Um, no, this came from. Actually, this came from PayPal Docs. So let's just not rock the boat too much here. I'm going to need to add something to the model, to the subscription model, to link it with the PayPal subscription ID. So we'll come over here, models. Go to this sidebar. Actually, I could have used that. Let's see. I think it's right here, though. Subscription model. We will remove the brain tree subscription ID. Where to market this is paid also. Make our migration to remove that field. Commit that change because I know it's going to be needed. And we will now add. PayPal subscription ID. It's a character field. No, uh, is it knowable? I think you should avoid null values if you can and have a default value, if I recall correctly. I 
If so, why is that the case? I think it's about database performance. In database Django database models, it's generally better to avoid null values and instead set a default value whenever possible. Here are some reasons why. Consistency. By setting a default value, you ensure that every instance of the model has a value for that field. Now, okay, that helps. So I don't have to do like null checks. This can make your code more consistent and easier to reason about. This is really important, especially if anyone has worked with MongoDB, you know about all the craziness that has to go on in your runtime code to account for not only null values, but yet yeah, values that have historically changed and it's a mess. Your whole schema doesn't go away. It just mo it moves into your runtime. It's not like, yeah, now we're schema list. No, you're actually increasing your maintenance burden generally speaking i'm not a big fan overall but i know that's very popular still querying when you query a database you can filter on the default value instead of having to check for null values this can make your query simpler and more efficient okay it was like a not null query would be pretty efficient as well or not string, I don't know. Validation, if you set a default value, you can ensure that the value is always valid for the field. This can help prevent errors and make your code more robust. So yeah, we're not having to validate at runtime. Serialization, if you use Django's built-in serialization tools, null values can cause problems when serializing and deserializing data. By setting a default value, you can avoid these issues. So we'll have a string that's already serialized. All right, so yeah, now I know. Always, Try to set default value. Avoid null if possible. Blank is okay, because blank generally gets uh, sort of serialized into an empty string. Cool, so we've got that. Let's add this migration. Make migrations. Oh, wrong one. Okay, so here's the tricky part. Now, I realized, you know, we're reducing the amount of abuse that could go along here. First, you have to have, you have to be logged in, but we don't have really strict requirements for login. Uh, then you're making a post request, to, so it's a bit more obscure of an endpoint. So, it's, you know, might not be so discoverable. Uh, then you have to have a subscription ID, which is also another piece of, you know, hidden information that makes it even less abuse prone. Uh, people could hammer this endpoint. And another thing is I'm going to be making an API call. So this could be setting us up for a denial of service attack. If somebody hammers this and we make a thousand calls to PayPal, so we might want to rate limit this. Third party libraries, yeah. I don't necessarily want to do that right off the bat. I don't want to over engineer this because I was thinking I could make it. A, Idempotent and just return the success or whatever. And also, I want to get or then I can get or create. Then we get that. So let's try this. Get or create. Then I can use this created sort of make as an adempency check uh, to avoid making 
or extraneous calls to PayPal if we've already got one. Okay. Notice how it's also picking up on my uh, sort of the context. Actually, it, uh, no, it's mistakenly the thing I'm working with um, orders. I don't know if I said orders somewhere along the lines. At work, I'm working with orders. Okay, so now we'll return early. Basically, if it's if I'm not creating one and it's not paid, and the request user is not uh, requesting it, whoa, well, this is a different thing. Uh, yeah, so first check it's request user. If not request user, return un unauthorized. All right, let's just let's just see what it's doing. We might not need to save there. But there's a couple of things not here. I can just do a no op. I don't know if I need an else. Because that's the library we're using. We're not used haven't used it yet. The PayPal endpoint is The problem is I don't have a way to like validate this in the client. If somebody makes a request for any reason to this endpoint, 
I don't think I can validate the authenticity of the request. So I have to, to my knowledge, I have to validate this somehow on the server, which is unfortunate. We said, uh, with um, Braintree, for example, we had this nonce, which somehow you know allowed us to keep things, keep the integrity of the request and response, so that I couldn't manipulate it, the user couldn't manipulate it, and uh, Braintree sort of had the uh, the truth. So I don't know if this is the right way of doing it, but. In our view, actually in our PayPal service, V1 subscription, that's good. And I will get subscription it's really good man so good this copilot stuff is so helpful uh, you know this is not like a super difficult function to write you know uh, it's just I don't have to think about it I have to think about it I read it and have to review it but it just saves me a lot of like mental cycles what's this Mm, yeah, we'll fix that. These, I guess, should both be responsive. And uh, well, I'll double check the docs as well. So we get the subscription ID there, you know, in the URL. Oops. So that seems correct. Uh, we have an authorization header. Content type header. So we've got those both here and constructed headers in the response. I think we'll look for this status. The other thing is I need to set the next billing time. Hmm. Start time, but I would like the end time if possible. So that's not there. I think it's here. So if it started uh, the annual cycle.
You know, I might just be able to rely on the status active. And hmm. trying to think if I need a webhook to synchronize this active status, or if at runtime I can run this check. Now that's an expensive operation. I know I need to at least do it here. So, but the question becomes: Is do I need to synchronize the validity date or something? in our system or can we just run run these active checks how costly would it be to make these HTTP requests every time a user requests a page that's pretty costly it's not every page but it's every time you request a magazine issue that's a um, subscriber only I'm sure I could tokenize that or something like that or Python So Django Core has a cache built. This is, I really just appreciate so many times the amount of things that Django provides when I need them. I don't have to use this cache. It might even be used internally in some cases for me on my behalf. Uh, but when I need it, it's there. It doesn't get in the way when I'm not using it, so to speak. Uh, but man, it just saves you so much hassle and headache and reinventing real low level details that are surprisingly complicated. This is one of the most complicated parts of computer science, in fact. All right, so we're gonna get the request and response. Check that. If it, so we have an outer function, I can get that in a moment. Or ostensibly that could just be in the same function. Yeah, the timeout would be set in seconds, milliseconds, seconds. How many seconds are there? I don't know, it's confusing. I think that's the way to go. And then I don't have to kind of synchronize the updated date or any of that stuff. Now, when generating our report, we also have a backend interface that lets you administer these. Uh, I would have to make that call repeatedly for every item in the table. However, most of this administration is going to happen in PayPal. So if they really want it, I can give them the reference to the PayPal ID and they can check the status there. I think this is shaping up to be the way I'll go. Got about 20 more minutes I can work on this issue. You can see the utility here of this, these sort of generative models. 
GitHub Copilot, I think it's based on ChatGPT and other tools that are, you know, they're built into the tool you're using. I'm using um, Code Editor here, but uh, it's really amplifying my work and helping clarify some things that I'm not familiar with. It's a tutor and an assistant and things like that. Yeah, so I'll, this is going to be a bit of a layer cake here, but we have subscriptions. So I'll just do def. I'll implement the caching. Hey, what's up? Valve, how are you doing today? You do any development? Software development or any, oh, let's see, it's already got some help from Copilot. So it gets the subscription and it checks that the status is active. That's pretty good. Now I want to avoid this uh, request if possible. So we're going to use this function here. Let me get this a little bit bigger so I can read it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I got to get this import here to give Copilot the hint. Even though it's got this chat on next to it, uh, the context isn't always there. Django core cache and then back to the function. So I want to get that. Uh, check the cache first. So we don't make any, any excessive calls and status. I think it was one. No, wait. Oh, no, no, you don't need that. It's a basically a dictionary, I guess. If status is not none, return status equals active. Otherwise, get that. I don't know. Wait a minute. I like the positive. It is not, I get confused. Cache status for one day. Then we'll we return the status. Granted, I could encapsulate this and just say,
I want to use something idiomatic, concise. And self-descriptive. This is checking the status. It's, it's fetching the status. This is a common convention. If is subscription active. You know, so it would be the same to say a subscription is active. There we go. So now we're not going to make too many excessive calls. I don't have to worry about synchronizing the value between PayPal and our backend, like the expiration date and all that stuff. You know, I could even cache it longer, but one day to the next, the subscription could expire. One hour to the next as well, but we're not really super stingy here. <laughs> When the, yeah, these things are destined to be the, in the public domain anyway, so, all right. So now I've got this PayPal helper I can use in the view, basically. And that way, um, in my view, I don't have to make requests. I can stay at one level of higher abstraction. Sort of following the return early pattern. And actually, I could move this into the model. I'm making it. These are PayPal subscriptions. We have a dependency. That's already there.
mega property is active. But the body is actually I'm going to use our PayPal module. Yeah, now I will use this is active flag throughout the rest of the app where I've used, I think, is paid or paid status or something like that. Um, so we don't need this flag anymore. It's going to be dynamic but cached, so we're straddling the line. One thing we're relying on this um, field quite a bit, this PayPal subscription ID. So I'm going to uh, index that. Under the class meta. Hmm. Really? Uh, what am I doing here? Class, that's what we're for. Foreign key fields are automatically indexed. Yeah, so basically when this view is called, and hopefully it won't be called quite a lot, we don't want to do a full table scan of all of our subscriptions. So we're going to be querying here get or create so we'll need to query that efficiently i think that's what we're after and i can take off these like redundant quotes I'll leave this one here because I don't have an explicit else. I have an early return, you know, so it's an implicit else uh, or an implicit if. Make sure I'm, you know, not missing anything. Uh, let's just say ensure the subscription is active. Now I'm hoping, I'm hoping. That in PayPal, this subscription will be marked as active as soon as this happens, this action here, subscription create, right? And I should not be able to get into the uh, approval until it's active. That's my assumption. It could be some asynchronous issues with that because on approve, I'm then going to call this. So it's a quick succession of actions. But I'm going to call this URL, which I, by the way, need to wire up here. And path. And 
the path for you going for us. And then that's where we are. I hope not, because I don't want to set up like celery or something. And the user is going to want, the person is going to want to use the, um, potentially going to want to use the service right away. So we could good faith activate that and then set up an asynchronous process to reconcile uh, the subscription status. But that's just getting complicated. I'm trying to avoid those types of things. Not easy. <laughs> Uh, decision in these architectural things they have trade-offs everything has trade-offs so to make my comments meaningful so people will want to pay attention I'll remove the ones that are not meaningful <laughs> right uh, these were also prompts I was prompting copilot Subscription, set the PayPal ID. PayPal subscription equals that. Oh, no, no, this is already done here. That's right. You know what? I could even do... this and make those unique together. Firstly, the PayPal subscription ID should be unique. Yeah, so that I need to set. to call it a day so we'll do one one thing at a time here Hmm. 
As far as I understand, there should not be a reason that people would have a, the same U, uh, subscription ID. I don't remember if that needs migration. has to be committed now because it's all, I'm already depending on this. And it, it depends on that, but I think I can just... Well, this is a convention we use. We try not to use these literals. Um, one day in seconds equals. That way I kind of give myself a little more explanation. You can also then search for that uh, in your code base. Let's see, so the view I think is complete, uh, initial, let's just say add initial. I'll read through it again, I just wanna kinda of get a little safety net. I haven't tried it out yet. I haven't tried any of this, of course.
I'm trying to think. So it's a bit. So this is what I'm caching. The value is a subscription status, and the object is a subscription ID. It's a bit. Uh, like I'm doing it wrong. This is setting the value. All right. Here's what I'll do. Uh, wait. One minute. Now it's the other way around. Ah, okay. So. That was a bit more explicit, and if I'm for any reason looking into the cache, I can be like, oh, that's what that is, and not have some random string. All right, I think it's a good stopping point for today. So yeah, I'll continue in the next session, uh, testing this view out, testing the flow, and working into the user interface layer where we will display these cards and I'll be able to link the cards on a subscription page and things like that. So I'm working inside out, I'm working from the sort of back end. First, these API endpoints that will be called in our on success callback working through that logic into the user interface yeah all right this has been another live code hangout thanks for stopping by valve and it's always nice to have somebody in the chat while i'm working and yeah if you'd like to check out the progress and you're seeing this video at a later date you can stop by github dot com slash western friend slash wf website i'm working in pull request number 907 i'll push these changes up momentarily cool thanks for tuning in i hope you're doing well have a great day